So I wanted to start off with a quick introduction about who I am and why I wanted to do this presentation today about um, some beginner birding identification tips, tools, and tricks. Uh, my background is a, as a wildlife biologist and also as a wildlife rehabilitator. I studied wildlife biology in college and um, I learned how to ID birds there using study skins and taxidermied mounts, which meant that I had the guide in one hand and I had the bird in the other. Um, followed that up by working in wildlife rehabilitation. And again, I had the guide in one hand, the bird in the other. Uh, it was a terrible crutch. I didn't learn bird ID skills very well. And um, I'm always trying to get a little bit better now that. Um, I'm looking for the birds out in the wild. Um, I don't consider myself to be an expert birder, uh, but I think that everybody is learning and there's always room to grow. Uh, this presentation is going to focus on ways that you can learn to and um, build your birding ID skills a little bit better. So I'm not gonna be going over specific birds and how to identify them, but rather some methods that I've used that have helped me grow my skills. Um, and the way that I like to think about it is as a wedge, uh, rather than um, trying to learn all of the species, I started by trying to learn the different groups of birds and then from there narrowing it down until I could identify species and I'm definitely still in the process of that but I think that's one of the exciting things about birding is that you are always learning new things and learning new birds and so without further ado some of the ID basics when you see a bird I think what a lot of people automatically go to is that uh they're looking at the color of the bird and trying to figure out what it is. I would propose to start a little bit different way with the shape and the posture of the bird. Um, moving on to if the bird's in flight, you can look at its flight pattern, uh, behaviors that it's showing, then going on to size. Then we'll look at things like field marks, plumage, um, and wrap it up with some information about songs and calls and uh, location and timing. And so those are the things that you wanna be paying attention to when you see a bird that you are hoping to identify. Um, Taking as much information as you can because we won't have, when you're out there birding, you don't have the benefit that I did when I was learning birds in school of having the guidebook in one hand and the bird in the other. Um, whenever you see a bird, you wanna, take in as much information as you can and try to remember all of that and it will help you as you're developing your birding skills and after we go over id basics i'm going to go over a few tools um, that you can all use to help you with this information that you've gained um, from this basic id so i think a lot of people can find birding intimidating but i, I really like to focus on the these silhouette pictures because it may, it helps people realize that they know a bit more than they like to let on. So I think most folks can identify number one as a goose, even without those field markings. Like I said, you don't need the plumage to tell you that that is a goose. You can tell just by the shape of the bird. You can tell that number two is some type of hawk. You can tell down on the fence post there that there's uh, number 20 is some sort of gull. 23 um, is an owl. Um, here's the full list if you want to look at it, but I think this this is, um, <clears throat> helps people get a little bit more confidence in realizing that you know a little bit more than you're letting on. And just knowing the shape of a bird, whether that um, is how they're standing as well. You notice that the owl is standing really upright, that gull is um, more horizontal to the ground, and just paying attention to the shapes and how the bird is um, posing. Similarly, um, here, this is from 
kind of a guidebook and helping to identify the groups of birds. So again, we're, we don't start by trying to identify every single species out there. You try to identify birds. And then once you get start getting comfortable with the group of birds, you can start narrowing it down to um, being able to know what that actual species is. And once again, I'm guessing that a number of you are able to just by these outlines have a guess at what kind of bird group those would we're talking about. Something else to be paying attention to if a bird's in flight, um, their wings and the shape of their wings will is another identifying clue. Really like this because it also gives a little bit of information about um, and obviously it's kind of a comic -y <laughs> version of it. There, there's more um, fancy versions of this, but I like the comic one. Um, that the wing type also tells you a little bit about how that bird may behave and not just the identification, um, but what their flight pattern might be. Um, Pay attention to tail shapes. Uh, there's a variety of tail shapes out there um, and that may help you identify birds. There's um, the fan versus the wedge there on the bottom is a good example that I was chatting recently about with one of our volunteers who I believe is on the call tonight um, that ravens have a V or the wedge-shaped tail, and it looks kind of like a V because there's a V in raven, and crows have the fan-shaped tail. So you see a blackbird, you're not sure which of crow, raven it is, um, the tail can also give you a clue. So paying attention to the actual outline of the bird, the wing shape, the tail shape, the beak shape, again, Beak can also clue you into what group it belongs to and um, a little bit more information about that bird. So is it a seed eater? Is it a raptor bird? Is it fruit eater? Things like that. And again, all of these little pieces will come together and start helping you to identify the bird. So when you're just learning, you don't go out and say, I know every bird that has a grain eating beak, but you can take that. I know this bird has a grain eating beak. I know it has this shape. I know um, it's got this tail shape and all of those pieces can come together to help you identify your bird. Flight patterns are another thing that can help identify birds whether it's how they're holding their wings uh, on the left. Well, both of these images here show kind of a variety of birds and how they look in flight. So um, the, this image on the right, the California condor on top flies very flat and straight as does the bald eagle. Um, but if you're looking at something like a golden eagle, uh, it's got a little bit more of shape to the wing than the condor does. Turkey vultures fly with their wings in a V, another um, mnemonic device, I guess, to help you remember vultures fly with their wings in a V shape. Um, and just paying attention to as many clues as you can um, I found this flight pattern tool today um, that is from the Museum of Science and they actually have, it's a little quiz where you can look at the different, turn off the sound there, um, flight patterns and then they have descriptions of them. So whether it is, a direct flight and undulating flight. So that's birds that are kind of flat, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide, but also going up and down as they're doing that. The flap, flap, glide, but straight across. Moth-like is just kind of a chaotic um, <laughs> flight pattern and then static and soaring. And again, an just another clue, it's not gonna, necessarily identify the bird for you if you look at this, but as you're out there learning your birds and 
um, it's another clue that'll help you figure out who you're looking at right there. Behavior is another one that I think people shy away from, but I think it's a really important one as well. And it can really help clue you into what group of birds you're looking at. So on the left here is a robin doing some foraging behavior. And I think we're all pretty familiar with the American robin and we've seen them out in our yards. They kind of do that little scurry along and peck and scurry along and peck um, like this guy's doing here. And so robins are actually a member of the thrush family. And um, on the right here is the hermit thrush. And you'll notice that he has a slightly different pattern where he does this sort of rocking thing with his leg. Um, but shortly, he's going to get to it and do that doo -doo -doo and peck. Little run along and peck, run along and peck. And again, this is something that can help you identify thrushes. Robins are thrush, even though they're named, they're not named a thrush, but they're, they're in that family. So again, can help you narrow down what group you're looking at. Let's go to the next slide. Ducks, similar thing. Um, there's commonly ducks are broken into either diving ducks, like this ruddy duck here. Um, we'll show that diving behavior. where the bird actually completely disappears as it is foraging along um, underneath the water. And eventually they will resurface, but that, that's a clue that you're looking at a diving duck. And sometimes guides will break ducks out into these different groups. So you wanna pay attention to that. Um, as opposed to the mallards, who are what is called a dabbling duck and they will either dive down, put their little butts in the air, or they'll um, swim along and just dabble along the surface, which is why they're called dabbling. There's two mallards in the front um, and a widgeon in the back, I believe. Um, but you notice as that widgeon comes by, seems a little bit different than the others, sort of catches your eye, a little bit of a different behavior, but also a dabbling duck. Um, don't, didn't mean to put the ruddy in there again, but this is an interesting behavior that Northern shovelers do where they will actually work as a group and kind of create a vortex by swimming in a circle. And I was actually out at Virginia Lake recently and noticed um, the shovelers caught my eye just because they had a different swimming pattern than the mallards that they were swimming within a flock of mallards, but I happened to catch the shovelers just based on this behavior alone. Um, so behavior can really help clue you in on who you're looking at. And then I used to work with California condors, so I always like to include them in my presentations. But um, interesting behaviors like displays for breeding can potentially also clue you into what bird you're looking at. But it's also just an exciting insight once you start to know the birds a little bit better, know what species you're looking at, and you can pick out what behaviors actually mean because they're, you know, they're, there are breeding behaviors, there's feeding behaviors, there's territorial behaviors, there's a whole host of behaviors and it opens up another world to birding when you start paying attention to the behaviors and you're not just focused on what species is it and what, what am I adding to my list? You're actually getting to know what kind, what this bird is and how they interact with each other. This is actually two males, um, there's one up front and one in the back doing a display to the female 
who does not seem overly interested in what those two boys have brought to her. She did eventually mate with one of them, but um, it's pretty interesting to watch for me anyway. Another thing that people want to go to kind of early on in their identification of a bird is the size. And I always caution against that being one of your number one um, identifying um, traits as you're looking at a bird, um, simply because birds can be really tricky with that forced perspective. So this is a giant gull who's way bigger than that human, obviously. Um, or is it just a gull who is closer to you on a ledge while that human is way off in the distance? And um, that force perspective can be really confusing, especially when birds are soaring out in the air and you have nothing to compare them to. You don't really know how far away they are um, unless they're with another species that you know the size of and they're in the air close to them, it can be really hard to tell what um, size they are. As you are looking at the size of a bird that you're able to tell what size it is, say it's perched somewhere close to you, one of the things that I find really helps me identifying size is comparing it to a species that I do know. So if I don't know that species, but I know that it is similar in size to uh, a red-tailed hawk, that can help me narrow in my identification rather than um, saying it's, you know, 12 inches long or something like that. Just comparing it to another species can really help you with your ID and it can help you when you're using a guidebook as well. Learn your field marks and plumage. Um, you'll notice that I did put this far down, a little bit farther down the list than a lot of people want to, but it is once you've identified some of those other easier things, and those will come much quicker to you as you practice them, you'll know your shapes, you'll know um, the different groups it may belong to, you'll start get to know the behaviors of that group, and maybe that this, spe this particular species within that group behaves slightly differently. Um, and then you'll want to look at those identifying field marks, because there are plenty of species that this is the only way you're going to be able to differentiate them. And in your guidebooks, as you're learning, you'll need to know the anatomy of a bird. Um, so understand when they say an eye ring, what do they mean by an eye ring? When they say that the wing bars are blue, what does that mean? Um, so there's a lot of different graphics out there. I like this one because it happened to be an actual picture of a bird, um, but study those so you know how to use your guidebook and you can use those field marks to help you identify your bird. Uh, location and timing is also really important to understanding what species you may be seeing, but, and this is a big but, you shouldn't put wildlife in a box ever. So even if the range map says a species isn't supposed to be somewhere that um, you think you're seeing it, it doesn't mean you're not seeing that species. Um, you may just be seeing, you may be seeing a, a rarity and that's always exciting and um, important to report. If you're interested in reporting your sightings, you can use eBird. Parker will be giving a presentation tomorrow evening on how to use eBird. Um, so I won't be going into that too much tonight, but um, on the left is kind of the standard guidebook version of a range map. And you can see there's different colors. So um, during the breeding season, spring, summertime, the orange areas are where you're going to see the species. Um, migration is in yellow and then non-breeding in blue and year round in purple. And on the right is actually a, mer a merp, a map created from eBird sightings. And the darker the purple, the more sightings um, they have in eBird of this species. So you can kind of see where it's darker purple on the right hand map is also where they are around year round on the right hand map. Um, so that makes sense. There's going to be more sightings where they're available to be seen all year. Um, the bottom of that is a histogram 
of a particular area, Washoe, um, where when the, this bird is spotted, so this is black chin hummingbird. Um, and as you can see on the map on the left, we are part of their migration slash breeding kind of area. <clears throat> so we don't see them in the winter months here, um, but pretty much the rest of the year. So that's an important thing to pay attention to. But again, remember that you should never put wildlife in a box, literally or figuratively. They're always going to surprise you. And um, don't count yourself out if you think you're seeing something that the maps and the timing tell you you shouldn't be seeing. It's a clue, but it's not a hard and fast clue. Songs and calls are a tricky thing, but they can be a lot of fun to learn as well. Um, I can't say I'm an advanced birder by ear, but there are a number of species that I do feel comfortable with. Looks like I neglected to label the um, spectrograph on the right, but that is uh, an image of the call of red-breasted nuthatch. Um, so, I'm going to go into this a little bit when I go into the tools for birding, but there, there's a number of tools you can use to identify bird songs. One of them is the spectrographs, and it's essentially uh, a visual representation of the sound itself. So you can see that these two birds have very different spectrographs, and you can identify the bird based on that. Um, field guides and apps. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. I have a couple field guides here that I like to use, um, but the important, most important thing with a field guide is making sure that it is something that you have, you're comfortable with. It is relevant to the area that you're birding. So if you are out here in the Nevada area, make sure you don't have an Eastern U.S. field guide, or if you're going to go somewhere internationally, make sure you get a guide that covers that area um, and practice using it before you go out in the field. Different guides will separate out birds in different ways. Um, I have one that divides them out by color, which is a little bit tricky because birds have many, <laughs> most birds aren't just one color. So, um, it's up to how the author defined this is a yellow bird versus it's a black bird. Um, so that's a little bit confusing, but knowing the groups of birds is typically how guidebooks break them out. So again, going back to that shape and um, the uh, posture and flight patterns of a bird will help you break down to what group you're looking for and that can get you to the right place in the guidebook to find the bird that you're actually looking at. Um, and then I'm gonna share a couple of apps that I find particularly useful um, when I'm out in the field. And this will just be a quick rundown of the few um, apps that I, I really like to use. They're all free, which is great. So you can mix and match, try them out, see which ones work best for you. Um, I'm not going to go into eBird because again, Parker is holding a webinar tomorrow evening on eBird. So sign up for that. Or if you're not able to join us tomorrow evening, you can always um, check out the recording because these webinars are recorded. But I'm going to go into the Audubon app first and show you the entry screen is you can either identify the bird that you're looking at and that's where the guide will ask, basically ask you the questions of the things that I told you you should be paying attention to when you see a bird um, and it'll help lead you to which bird you saw or you can search the guide and just look through it yourself. We're gonna go into identify a bird and notice the first thing it asks is where did you see the bird? So saying Nevada, and when did you see the bird? <clears throat> it's defaulting to today's date and my location. Um, but again, that's, 
that's just a way that uh, the app narrows in it. And you may be seeing a bird that it won't include based on those factors, but size, compare it to something that you know. I think we all are familiar with some of these birds. So what, what size bird are we looking at? Color, you can pick multiple colors that are on the bird that you saw. So you're not limited to just one um, type of bird. Again, this is where understanding the different groups of birds can help you out. And they've got nice little outlines. So if you don't remember what you're seeing, what shape you're seeing, um, or can't really identify what shape you're seeing, it'll help you narrow it down there. Activity, <clears throat> again, a variety of activities. Did you see different flight patterns? Um, was it perched? Was it running? tree climbing, walking, hopping, swimming, all of the above. <laughs> Probably not going to be doing all of the above, but it, you can select multiple if you saw it doing multiple things while you were watching that bird. What habitat is it in? Um, I forgot to mention this when I was talking about location, but the habitat that you're seeing a bird in can also help you identify <clears throat> what kind of bird you're seeing. The Audub one of the things about the Audubon app that I really like is that it has voice. And I, again, I am not great at birding by ear, but it's something that I'm trying to learn. And this is something that helps me because I'm able to actually play the sound um, and say, yes, it kind of sounded like that, that little bit of um, bird noise. And obviously, there's going to be a variety of them, um, and it's not going to match exactly to what's being played in here, but it can help you start to learn those different bits of bird songs and be like, ah, yes, 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 I remember that type of bird chatters and help you define those sounds. I have a really hard time with that, so that helps me out. Wing shape, what type of shape, what type of wing shape are you seeing? And again, the tail shape. Um, helps narrow that down. And as you pick these different um, attributes of the bird that you saw, say it's a rounded tail with a long wing, you'll see the possibilities at the bottom are changing. I saw it in the desert, probably didn't see a mallard in the desert. Um, so again, it starts narrowing it down. And these apps are great. Um, to help you learn. And once you start learning those things on your own, I I find that I like using the guide a little bit better because the, the apps narrow things down based on the attributes that you put in. But again, if you're seeing something that's outside of maybe the normal, the app's not gonna show you that. Um, LarkWire is actually a tool that, um, I use to help me learn bird songs. It is a quiz based app and it will show, it will play songs and you have to say which bird you're hearing. So I like that one. If you want to practice birding by ear, Merlin Bird ID is similar to the Audubon app where you'll put in your location, date that you saw it, general size of the bird, colors that you saw, what was the bird doing? And it creates a list of birds. So you can see it's not as comprehensive as the um, Audubon app, as far as what attributes you put in, but it still does a great job of identifying them. One of the great things about Merlin is it ha now has a sound and photo ID option. Photo ID from a phone can be really hard to get a good picture of a bird, but if you're able to, um, you can use that feature, the sound ID. You can actually just use the microphone on your phone and it will record any birds that it hears and automatically start popping up with identifications. And it can actually identify multiple species at the same time. So if there's multiple birds calling, it can pick them out and it's basing it on the spectrographs of, um, 
the birds. So you can see here's an example of my son talking. And then I don't know if you can hear that, but you can see along the screen, there's a little spectrograph um, and it's just barely picking it up, but it still was able to identify the golden crowned kinglet. And then I saw that bird. Um, so that was exciting to use that features. Pretty amazing. Um, Song Sleuth does the same thing that the sound ID does in Merlin bird ID. Uh, it's a little bit clunkier. So now that Merlin has it, <clears throat> I would recommend using that instead. Seek is a is tied to iNaturalist. So I'll go over iNaturalist first. Um, iNaturalist is a citizen science app where you can take a picture, record a sound, um, and upload that for use in um, scientific papers. I, I did my master's on a poorly understood <laughs> mammal that is really hard to find. And I did use sightings from iNaturalist for it. So iNaturalist is not specific to birds. It um, is anything in the natural world that you see, but it is a crowdsourcing thing. So what happens is you'll take a picture or sound, put it in your account, and people can come in and agree with your identification, if you did an identification, if you were able to identify it, you can put in, I saw a Western yellow jacket and somebody else can come in and say, I agree with that um, identification. If you don't know what it is, you can just put it in the picture and other people will help you to identify. So whether it's a bird that you weren't able to identify using those other apps or you weren't sure if you got it right or not, this can be a great way to confirm your sightings. Um, the other app that I mentioned was attached to that is Seek, and it is similar to the Merlin bird ID in that you take, it has photo abilities. So if you take a picture, it's able to identify pretty amazingly. Take a picture of a flower, it can tell you what type of flower it is, take a picture of a bird. It um, has an amazing algorithm that is able to help you identify things. And all of these things are great tools, but again, I like to use them as if they're an expert taking me on a bird walk. And uh, as I learn things, I try not to rely heavily on the apps to help me identify things. I try to challenge myself, but it, they, it's, an amazing tool that most of us have in our back pocket all the time, but I don't, when I'm out birding, I don't want to have my face in the phone <laughs> the whole time. Um, but like I said, they're, they're really um, just amazing tools to, to be able to use out in the field. So I recommend downloading those and giving them a try next time you're out in the field. And otherwise, I would really recommend joining us on a bird walk because we do have some experts who are happy to lead you. And we also have some folks like myself who maybe aren't, wouldn't consider ourselves experts, but we're always happy to get out there and bird with other great folks and learn together. And with that, I will take any questions that anyone may have. All right, yes, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to uh, use the Q&A button to uh, um, uh, ask uh, one, yes. There's, uh, have, nobody has submitted one on Zoom yet, uh, but, uh, and I'm looking on Facebook, I don't see any comments on Facebook, uh, um, uh, but however, I do uh, for now have a question. Uh, Hey, Jenny, uh, are you going to be uh, um, leading any other events for October Big Day? The great question, Parker. I will be leading a beginning bird walk on Saturday 
at Virginia Lake at 10 a.m. Um, where we will be testing out some of these apps and getting some practice with them. And again, just going out, learning together and checking out some of the birds that are out there. We're in the middle of fall migration, so there might be some exciting things to be seen. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, yes, uh, for another question, uh, you mentioned field guides. Uh, are there any specific uh, um, field guide brands or, uh, um, yeah, brands that you recommend? Um, the two that I regularly use and they just um, are convenient for me. I don't know if they necessarily are the best, but they're the ones that I'm comfortable with. Again, one of the most important things about a guide is making sure you know how to use it and it's comfortable for you. Um, but I use the Sibley field guide. It looks like that's mirrored image. Um, of Western North America, as well as I really like this um, Laws Field Guide to the Sierra Nevada. It's more than just birds. This is the one that I said does things by color, but it's got plants, it's got insects, mammals, reptiles, birds, um, a whole variety of things. And I live up in the Tahoe Basin, so this is a great guide for me to always keep in my backpack is just um, a general guide. I don't, it, it's not the most advanced as far as birds go, but it is a good general guide. Good question. Thanks, Parker. Of course. Well, uh, I do not see any other uh, questions submitted uh, on either our uh, Facebook page or on our Q&A tab. So uh, I think uh, it is time to call it an evening. Uh, once again, for those of you who joined us, thank you so much for uh, joining our webinar tonight. Uh, a big round of applause to you, Jenny. Uh, we wish you uh, all the best on your upcoming walk at Virginia Lake. And uh, um, yes, uh, Please do join us tomorrow. Uh, I will be hosting my eBird webinar. Uh, to register for our eBird webinar, just uh, visit our website, which you can see on your screen right now, www.nevadaaudubon.org. All our events are listed on our calendar, and they are free and open for everyone. Until then, see you next time, everybody. Thank you.